Welcome, 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 everyone. It's what a great turnout. I'm so gratified to see this big audience for our uh, wonderful speaker tonight. Um, I'm Charles Goodrich, the director of the Spring Creek Project for Ideas, Nature, and the Written Word, the primary sponsor of tonight's event. As you noticed when you came in, we have some um, really uh, uh, marvelous environmental and social justice groups tabling in the lobby. I want to thank them for being here tonight. Uh, and more, I want to thank them for their uh, knuckle down and get it done uh, efforts on behalf of species preservation and habitat preservation and uh, the greater good of humans and of the uh, entire planet. We talk about global warming and other potentially cat catastrophic challenges we, we may understandably feel anger, confusion, sometimes even despair. Truly the antidote is to join with others and take on the task in any ways we can find. Um, the only thing that matters really for our standing in the community and for our own sense of self-worth is to be able to say we gave it everything that we had. So the groups will be tabling in the lobby after the talk too, and I encourage you to stop by and thank those people for their work and, and uh, see if they're some, doing something that you might feel good about joining in on. Now, uh, here to introduce Elizabeth Colbert, my great friend and colleague, writer, philosopher, and dedicated environmental activist, Professor Emerita of Philosophy, co-founder, and now a uh, senior fellow with the Spring Creek Project. Please welcome our own Kathleen Dean Moore. Welcome. I am so glad that you're here. Let's start tonight with two facts. Fact number one, we, you and I, have the astonishing good fortune to live in the late Eocene when the earth has achieved a great fullness of flowering, a time that Thomas Berry called the most lyric period in earth history, a time of thrush song and 30,000 species of orchids and whales that teach each other to sing. Fact number two. Over the last 40 years, our way of life has reduced the plant and animal populations on this planet by 40 to 50 percent. We will die in a world that is half as flourishing with plants and animals as the world we were born to. I don't know about you, but I cannot begin to wrap my mind around this. So I'm deeply grateful to Charles Goodrich and the Spring Creek Project for bringing Elizabeth Colbert to Corvallis. And I'm deeply grateful to Elizabeth for her extraordinary mind and her essential work. She is one of the finest environmental journalists of our time, bearing witness to one of the most important issues of all time. Elizabeth Colbert is a staff writer for The New Yorker, whose beat is this beautiful, reeling world. Her early series on global warming, The Climate of Man, won the AAAS Magazine Writing Award, the National Academy's Communication Award, and the National Magazine Award for Public Interest. This courageous truth-telling grew into a book, Field Notes from a Catastrophe, Man, Nature, and Climate Change. It's a critically important book that we should study, both for the stories it tells and for the brilliance of the storytelling. She subsequently received a Heinz Award, a Lannan Literary Award, and the 2010 National Magazine Award for Reviews and Criticism. It's really wonderful to see her work honored and empowered this way. And speaking of honors and empowerment, Elizabeth was recently interviewed by the two interviewers I admire most, Terry Gross and John Stewart. <laughs> and now Elizabeth Colbert brings us a new book, The Sixth Extinction and Unnatural History. It is not possible to over, over, overstate the importance of Colbert's book, the San Francisco Chronicle wrote, and I agree. It's a page turner, that's for sure. And I bet that every reader is tempted to flip to the last page to see how the story of the sixth extinction ends. But I guess the ending is up to us, isn't it? 
And that's her point. Please welcome Elizabeth Colbert. Um, thank you very much, and, and thank you for that really lovely introduction. It's very, unfortunately, the one problem with introductions is the better they are, the harder they are to live up to. Um, but thank you very much. And I also just want to, before I launch in, I also want to say how um, happy I am to see all the groups out, the local groups out there at this event tonight. It's really um, impressive, and it's a tribute to this community to have so many people out on the ground uh, doing the really hard work of, of making things happen. So I want to thank those groups sort of in advance. Thank, 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 I don't want to say thank you, thank them. So, okay, I'm going to start out actually uh, by introducing you um, to this fellow. Um, and his name is Kanoe. And those of you who have um, read my book, The Sixth Extinction, and if you got all the way to the end and you know who you are, um, you, will, you will recognize him um, because he's a character in the book. And as you can see, he, he looks a lot like a, an ordinary you know, crow, American crow that we'd, we'd see in the continental US. Um, but if you're, if you're a bird person, you may notice some differences. His, his beak is fatter, for example, and so are his legs. And before humans arrived uh, on the Hawaiian Islands, the archipelago actually had several species of crows that probably diverged from our crows here, um, uh, you know, in the lower 48, uh, several hundred thousand years ago. So this is a story that's sort of a lot like the story of Darwin's finches, of an animal arriving somewhere. We're, we're not sure exactly how, although, you know, suggestively these animals are often birds that can fly. Um, and they arrive on an archipelago and then they speciate out to fill different niches and survive in different sorts of habitats. So the difference is that in the case of the Hawaiian crows, most of the species did not live into this century. Um, and this is the only species that did and it is uh, native actually to the Big Island. And it too is now extinct in the wild. Um, the last wild uh, birds, the last wild alalas were seen in 2002. Um, and there are probably a number of factors that led to their demise, and these include habitat destruction, so cutting down the forest on the Big Island, um, the introduction of predators like mongoose that feed on bird chicks, uh, and the introduction of uh, insects like mosquitoes. Hawaii had no mosquitoes, and now it has mosquitoes that carry avian malaria, which you may have read has been quite devastating to a number of native species in Hawaii. So anyway, before... Um, a few decades ago already, people realized that these birds were in big, big trouble. Um, and so they took some of them out of, the, out of the forest or, you know, what's left of the forest, and they brought them to a breeding facility on a different island, on Maui. And that is actually where Kanoe himself was born uh, 20, about 20 years ago. And he is quite an odd bird. Um, he was raised by people, and so he doesn't really uh, self-identify as a bird. Um, or at least not as a, as a crow. And um, someone who, who knows him quite well told me that um, he once fell in love with a spoonbill. And so Kanoe refused to um, mate with the other crows at this facility. Um, at this point, there are maybe 100 of them, so maybe you know, 50 of them were female. And, and those are all of the alalas that are left you know, on the planet. And, and he's quite old now. Um, and so for precisely that re reason, because he's part of the small sort of original population, um, his genes are very important. So a couple of years ago, he was uh, flown to California and brought to live at the San Diego Zoo's veterinary hospital. And, when, and there he came under the care of a, of a reproductive physiologist named Barbara Durant. And every spring, um, when it's... Uh, mating season for crows back in Hawaii, uh, Durant takes Kanoe on her lap and strokes him in a way that he is supposed to find very, very exciting. 
and she is hoping that uh, Kanoe will, you know, come come through, as it were, and she will be able to collect his semen in a little tube and fly with it to Maui and artificially inseminate some of the females at that breeding um, facility. And about, I was out in San Diego, I guess, um, about a year and a half ago now, and uh, she in offered to introduce me to Kanoe, and he he turns out to be a very um, charismatic, if sexually confused, bird. And he, he hopped over to see us. He has this great big cage, not like, you know, a little parakeet cage, but a whole room for his entertainment. And we could stand around in it. And um, he, he came over to us. And it, it seemed to me um, that he definitely recognized Durant. Um, he seemed a little embarrassed to see her. You know, that, that may be, of course... It may be projection, of course, but he seemed a little bit, uh, he seemed to feel their relationship was a little bit awkward. Um, and she had, um, she, she, I guess you could say she knows the way to a bird's heart, and she had um, brought with him her some of these snacks that he likes, which are these mice, newborn mice, which are called in the trade pinkies because they have no hair, so they're pink. Um, and he likes those, and so he hopped over to peck at them. And um, crows are very intelligent, as I'm sure you know, and they can imitate human speech. And so Kanoe says, I know. Um, it sounds a little bit uh, crazed when he says it, um, but, but if you know what you're listening for, you can hear him say, you know, you can realize that he's saying, I know. And to me, he sort of sums up this very um, strange and very sad situation that we find ourselves in. You know, um, here we have this crow. He's one of the very last representatives of his species on Earth. And <clears throat> people have gone to quite fantastic lengths to try to save these species. They've set up this breeding facility. Um, they are, you know, in effect, giving hand jobs to crows. So, you know, people really do care about animals, um, what, what the writer Rachel Carson called the problem of sharing our Earth with other species. But at the same time, um, we are, as a species, um, as you know, uh, we, we, are, we are killers. Um, we are driving more and more species, like the Alala, to the very, very brink of extinction, and we are driving more and more species over the brink of extinction. Um, so Kanoe, in his sort of black, you know, Hamlet-like getup, uh, made a big impression on me, and his and his saying, calling, you know, I know, I know. Um, so in my mind, he really became sort of an emblem for this great world-changing project that we are all collectively embarked upon. So what what is the sixth extinction? Um, the implication here, obviously, is that there have been five uh, earlier extinction events, and that is obviously the case. Um, and what you're looking at here is a little bit of a complicated chart, but all, all you need to know is that you're looking at time on the bottom, on the x-axis there, that's 600 million years ago, going forward to zero to the present. Those are the geological ages there. And then on the y-axis, you're looking at the number of marine families. So we're looking at an analysis of the marine fossil record. It, this is a very famous graph, actually, in, in paleontological circles. Um, and when you, see, when you see those big dips, that's where the number of marine families suddenly dropped. And if you are a bio student or you remember your, your introductory bio, you know that a family is the group just above a genus, which is the group above a species. So if just one species made it through an extinction event, the family counts as a survivor. So these extinction events on a species level are much, the losses are much, much greater. So every one of those little dips represents a loss of roughly three quarters of the species on Earth, um, in some cases even more. So those are the five what are called major mass extinction events. They're sometimes called the big five. And all they are, are are moments, and by moments I mean moments in a geological sense. They are moments when, for one reason or, or another, the diversity on Earth suddenly plunged. Uh, two British paleontologists whom I quote in the, in the book, who have studied mass extinction, define these events as <clears throat> events that eliminate a significant proportion of the world's biota in a geologically insignificant amount of time. And another uh, British, British paleontologist whom I 
whom I cite in the book, has, uses the metaphor of the tree of life. During a mass extinction, he's written, vast swaths of the tree are cut short as if attacked by crazed, axe-wielding madmen. So the first, the first of these extinction events, number one there on this chart, uh, occurred at the end of what's known as the Ordovician period, which was a very, very long time ago, 440 million years ago. And at that time, life was still, for the most part, confined to the water. So this was a very bad event if you were a creature in the water. It wasn't so bad uh, if you were on land, but the fact is that there were virtually no creatures on land. So the fifth one, uh, number five there, that was about 66 million years ago. That's, that's the famous event that everyone's familiar with. That's the extinction event that did in the dinosaurs, as well as many, many other very dominant groups on Earth. And there's a pretty broad consensus now that that event was caused by an asteroid impact. And unfortunately, no one was there to take a photo, but I like, I like this particular drawing of the event. So to say that we um, are in the sixth extinction is obviously a, a, a pretty serious claim to make. Um, and the reason that we're in the sixth, and some experts would say, well, we're just at the verge of it. We could still prevent an extinction event. And some other scientists would say we're pretty deep into this one already, um, is that we're changing the world very, very radically. And we're doing it very, very quickly. So not unlike an asteroid. Um, and in fact, you will hear, and I have heard scientists say, uh, this time around, we, i.e. human beings, we, we are the asteroid. So how, how are we doing this? How are we changing the world um, on an asteroid-like scale? There, there are actually, unfortunately, a number of ways. Um, but this evening, I'm, I'm just going to uh, talk briefly about three of them that, for various reasons, seem to be the most significant. And one is how we're changing the atmosphere, uh, how we're changing the oceans, and how we're changing what Darwin called uh, the principles of geographical distribution. So we'll start with our atmosphere, good place to start. Every, every year, um, we human beings add on the order of 10 billion metric tons of carbon to the atmosphere. And that is coming, for the most part, from burning fossil fuels. And you all know this, so I, I'm not going to belabor it. You know, we, we drive our cars, uh, we turn on our lights, and there are now almost 7.3 billion people on the planet, so it, it pretty quickly adds up. And what we're doing when we uh, burn fossil fuels is that we're taking carbon that was buried over under the earth, uh, underground, over the course of hundreds of millions of years, and we are transferring it back up into the atmosphere. Um, so we are, we're basically running geological history backwards and at a very high speed. So we're taking a process that took hundreds of millions of years to run in one direction, and we are running it in the other direction in a matter of centuries. And if you were, were an alien and you came down to Earth, you could quite possibly conclude that what, that what we're doing, that the primary you know, purpose of our modern society is to effect this transfer as quickly as possible. Um, to see how much carbon we can uh, dig out of the ground or pump out of the ground and, how, and put into the air and how fast we can do it. And if the aliens were measuring this process, and of course, you know, we are actually measuring this process, uh, they'd say we're doing quite a good job. We are raising atmospheric CO2 levels uh, every year. So this is a very famous graph, maybe one of the world's most famous graphs. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. It's a, it's a Keeling curve. It's named for Charles David Keeling, who is a guy who were, spent most of his uh, life down, down the coast in California at the Scripps Institution and figured out a way to measure CO2 levels in the atmosphere very precisely. And this is a continuous measurement that's been taken uh, at the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii since 1958. So these are CO2 levels in the air. Um, and you may have read, read recently that CO2 levels reached 400 parts per million. Uh, that green line is 400 parts per million, and that is indeed the case. That reading uh, is from you know, last week, January 25th, and if you want to look every day, you know, go to the Scripps Institution website, look up the killing curve, and every day you will get the CO2 reading. So <clears throat> what you're seeing, that sort of sawtooth pattern, um, that is a seasonal signal. 
So when the trees uh, and plants of the northern hemisphere uh, put out their leaves in summer and, and start photosynthesizing, taking CO2 out of the air for photosynthesis, globally CO2 levels go down. And then when those trees go dormant, uh, globally CO2 levels go up again. And, and that's just a function of the fact that we have more forests and indeed more land here in the northern hemisphere. Um, so over the summer, over this past summer, CO2 levels went down. They dipped below 400 parts per million. Uh, and now they're back, going back up again. And this up and down pattern is just going to continue on and on uh, until we stop uh, pouring CO2 uh, into the atmosphere. And a few years from now, not very long from now, we will reach a point where we will never uh, go beneath 400 parts per million uh, winter or summer. Uh, and that's just going to uh, keep going up, as I said, uh, until we stop emitting CO2. Um, and if we want to know how long we're doing at a, on a longer time scale, uh, we have a very interesting way of doing that. We look at ice cores. So an ice sheet, there are, there are two major ice sheets on the planet right now, one in, one in Greenland and one on Antarctica. All these ice sheets are, are layers of snow that have built up year after year. They haven't melted uh, in the summertime, so they just build up. And what happens is that the pressure of the uh, weight of the snow uh, transforms the crystal structure into ice. Uh, but basically, all these ice sheets are, are just layers and layers of snow. And you can take a core, you send down that tube, uh, and you set it spinning, and you pull up a cylinder of ice. And you keep doing that over and over again until you reach the bottom of the ice sheet. And then you have this record of the ice sheet going through time, right? So the most recent ice is near the top. The oldest ice is near the bottom. And this ice contains actual bubbles of past atmospheres. So we have sort of an archive of the atmosphere in these ice sheets. And this is a drilling operation. What you're actually looking at here is a room carved out of the Greenland ice sheet that I actually visited several years ago. Uh, this is a Greenland ice core. But if you want a really good record, Greenland ice runs out uh, after about 130,000 years. If you want a really long record, uh, you go to Antarctica and you get a record like this. So what we're looking here at here, once again, is your, on your left is the oldest, 800,000 years ago, going forward in time. And that red line, that is just, those are atmospheric CO2 levels taken from what was called the Epica core, the, uh, the, so far the longest, uh, or oldest ice core uh, ever, ever, ever taken. And those up and down dips that you're seeing, those are ice ages. So when CO2 levels drop, the ice sheets descend from the North Pole. Uh, we get ice covering most of Canada, much of the northeastern US. Uh, the last ice age ended about 12,000 years ago. The ice did not get down as far as Oregon. Um, but so much water was tied up in the ice sheets that the coast was uh, 10 or 20 miles uh, further out to sea than it is today. And those high points where CO2 levels are higher uh, those, are, <clears throat> those are interglacials, when the ice retreats. So we are, of course, in an interglacial right now. But as you can see from this chart, um, we've really radically changed the shape of this curve now. So CO2 levels have not been above 300 parts per million for the last 800,000 years. You can see that that's that dotted line. Um, and probably a lot longer. Um, it's just that we don't have any older ice. And now we're up near, we're up at 400 parts per million. That's a little bit above that blue dot. Uh, that green dot is where we're headed if we work very, very hard to keep our emissions down. And that yellow dot is where we're headed if we just keep on letting emissions increase every year. So by the end of this century, CO2 levels will almost certainly be twice as high as they were before we embarked on this world-changing project. And quite possibly, they will be three times as high. And if we, we want to go further back, as I said, we run out of ice. But we do have ways of teasing out the composition of the atmosphere from other uh, leftover bits of evidence, uh, including the shells of little marine creatures that fell to the bottom of the sea uh, and piled up there. And these methods are not as exact, uh, but they give us a pretty good picture. And if it turns out if you want to find CO2 levels that are much higher than today's, you have to go back quite a long way, perhaps uh, as long as uh, ago as the Miocene, which was around 20 million years ago. 
Um, and if we just keep pouring CO2 into the atmosphere at current rates, we could very easily reach Miocene levels within the next couple of decades. Uh, and if we keep on going our merry way until the end of the century, we just keep dumping CO2 into the atmosphere, um, we could reach Eocene levels, so levels that have not been seen uh, for the last 50 million years uh, by the end of this century. So, you know, what's significant about this, as you all know, is that CO2 just has certain geophysical properties that make it a greenhouse gas. I, I am not going to give this audience, uh, which is a very knowledgeable audience, a whole global warming spiel. Uh, it's very basic science. I'm just going to show you this wonderful uh, machine, uh, which is a, uh, looks like sort of a Rube Goldberg contraption, but was actually, is actually a ratio spectrophotometer, and it was developed by a really brilliant British scientist in the middle of the 19th century, John Tyndall, uh, to look at the properties of different gases. And when Tyndall, back in the 1850s, uh, looked at carbon dioxide, he immediately realized uh, that it had this very interesting property of being a greenhouse gas. So this is something that we have understood, that scientists have understood for over a century and a half now, um, that CO2 has this property of trapping heat. Uh, and if you were raising atmospheric sea levels very quickly, you would expect to be trapping, you know, all things, other things being equal, you'd expect to be trapping more heat near the surface of the Earth, and you would expect average global temperatures uh, to be going up. And indeed, as you all know, that is exactly uh, what's been happening. So this next slide that I'm going to show you is not a slide. It's a video. It was made by NASA. And to understand it, all you need to know is that when the colors are sort of warm, like what we associate as warm colors, yellowy and red and orange, that means warm temperatures. And when they're cooler colors, blue, uh, those are cooler temperatures. And this uh, is NASA's recreation of global temperatures going back to when we started using, um, getting accurate temperature measurements back in the 1880s. So that, one of the things that you see really clearly from that recreation is that temperatures have been warming a lot faster in the Arctic than in the rest, uh, even in the rest of the planet. Um, they've been going up very, very quickly in recent years. And so when you think about what climate change means for other creatures, uh, the polar bear has sort of become this iconic species. The polar bear hunts off the sea ice. The sea ice is retreating very very quickly, uh, and you figure, well, the polar bears are going to be in trouble if there's no more sea ice. Um, but one of the points that I want to make tonight, and I, I really want to say it's not my point at all, it's a point of the scientists who are out in the field studying this sort of thing, um, is that the effects of climate change are likely to be even more devastating in the, in the tropics. And there's several reasons for this, but the really most basic reason is that the tropics are where most species actually live. So let's just take, for example, the example of trees. Um, here we are looking down a ridge in a cloud forest uh, in Peru. So we're looking from the Andes down, out, down towards the Amazon basin. And I went um, up to this spot, you're up at about 12,000 feet where this picture was taken um, a couple of years ago with a, a group of American scientists led by a guy out of Wake Forest named Miles Silman. And Miles Silman and his students had mapped out these plots of two and a half acres each. And in each of those plots, they had tagged and ID'd every single tree. So they had 20 plots, they were two and a half acres each, so we're talking about 50 acres of trees. And in those 50 acres, they had found a thousand different species of trees. And if you went up to Canada's boreal forest, which covers about a billion acres, uh, and you tagged every single tree, uh, you would only find about 20 species of trees. So that gives you a sense of where the diversity uh, of life resides. 
So the point of this experiment in, in the Andes was to see what happens to trees as the climate warms. So one of the corollaries to having a very high number of species is that in the tropics, species tend to have very narrow climatic ranges. So as we were hiking down that, that ridge that I showed you, it actually took us three days to hike down that ridge, um, Miles Silman said to me, you know, while, while you're walking along the path, just pick out a leaf that has an interesting shape and, you know, watch it as we go down. You're only going to see that leaf, that shape of leaf for about 100 yards because that is that tree's whole range. It only lives in that very narrow band where the climate conditions are now favorable for it. And so by laying out these plots, what they were hoping to find out is how these very narrowly adjusted species were going to respond to climate change. So to track the climate, to stay in the same climate you know, that they have traditionally been in, uh, these trees were going to have to be moving up slope, up the mountains, uh, by several yards per year, um, because that's how fast the Andes are warming. But you know, now, of course, I hear you, you know, object that trees don't actually move, which is true. Um, but they can, they do do the next best thing, which is they, you know, put up their seeds, and the seeds get moved around either with the wind or with, by animals. Um, and if conditions are changing, then the seeds are likely to sprout uh, in different places. And what they have found is that some, some species are moving fast enough to track the climate. Um, so they're unit, let's say you had a species that you used to find, let's say, only at 2,000 meters, and now you find it at you know, 2050 meters, 2100 meters. Um, but the vast majority of species are, are not moving. Most of them are just sort of sitting there. So these tree communities, which have been very stable in the tropics over many thousands of years, are, are beginning to break down. And then the obvious question that you ask yourself is, okay, what's going to happen to the other creatures in these, uh, that are part of these communities, to the insects and to the birds and to the mammals? Um, and those are much harder to study, as you can imagine. You know, an insect, it doesn't live very long, and it refuses to stay in the same place. So you can't just stick a tag in it and come back year after year. Um, so many people are trying to figure out, you know, exactly how to study these issues. But one of the points that uh, Miles Silman made to me was, unfortunately, you know, we are going to find out the results uh, whether we want to or not because we have already set this great experiment in motion uh, without knowing uh, exactly where it's going to take us. So how else are we changing the planet? Well, climate change, as you know, probably, is uh, only one effect of pumping billions of tons of CO2 into the, year, into the air every year. Um, there's also what's sometimes called, and I believe this phrase may have been uh, um, first used by uh, Jane Lubchenco of here, of OSU, um, is global warming's equally evil twin, uh, which is ocean acidification. And ocean acidification is taking place um, because when you put a, you know, billions of tons of CO2 into the air every year, a lot of it very, very quickly is getting absorbed by the surface waters of the oceans. And the, the chemistry of this all is, is a little bit complicated, and I'm not going to you know, go into the details of it tonight, and many of you are probably actually better at it than I am. Um, but basically, all you need to know is that when CO2 dissolves in water, it forms an acid. Uh, carbonic acid. It's a weak acid. If you had a, a Coke today, you drank it, um, but it is nevertheless an acid, and if you pour enough of it into the water, uh, you're going to change the water chemistry. So we don't live in the oceans. We don't have a very intuitive sense of what ocean acidification means, um, but a lot of scientists are looking into this question, a lot of them right here in Oregon, where a lot of very important work has been done. And one thing that's pretty clear about ocean acidification is that it is going to lay, make life more difficult for any kind of creature that builds a shell or an external skeleton uh, out, of the mineral cal sorry, out of the mineral calcium carbonate. Um, just because of the way the chemistry of the water is changing, it's going to become harder and harder for them to put together those shells. So there turn out to be an awful lot of marine organisms who need to do it. Um, it's a big issue here, uh, probably as big as anywhere, uh, in, here in Oregon, where you have a lot of oyster hatcheries. Um, <clears throat> oh, sorry, these, this is, these are just a couple of sort of a handy cheat sheet 
uh, on ocean acidification. Um, the oceans have absorbed about a third of the carbon dioxide we've put up there uh, since the start of the Industrial Revolution. That's 150 billion metric tons. Um, every four hours, the seas absorb another million metric tons. And the net result is that the acidities of the oceans have already, has already increased by 30%. So I'm just also gonna show you a bunch of creatures that, that are what are called marine calcifiers who make shells or external skeletons out of calcium carbonate. Um, these are foraminifera. Uh, they're tiny, they're very tiny. You're seeing them under a high magnification. They form these big blooms in the ocean. Sometimes you may have seen photos where a whole section of the ocean it turns a sort of a milky white color, because that's because there's so many. Um, very common shellfish that we like to eat are, are calcifiers, sea urchins, starfish, uh, and reef-building corals, what are known as stony corals. So to give you just a sense of what an acidified ocean looks like, I'm going to show you a couple more photos. Um, this is a very interesting sort of natural experiment that I visited a couple of years ago with some British scientists. And I was also lucky enough to go with a photographer from National Geographic who took the underwater photos that I'm about to show you. And what you, what you just need to understand to understand these photos is that <clears throat> this is an area we're in the Bay of Naples. So here's the first one. We're in the Bay of Naples here. Uh, and you're seeing a pretty ordinary assemblage of creatures you'd expect to see in the Mediterranean. You're seeing you know, a sea urchin, you're seeing some corals in there, uh, you're seeing <clears throat> some shellfish and some, some of this stiff seaweed that you see. And this is an area near Mount Vesuvius where there's a lot of volcanic activity and so there's actually carbon dioxide, bubbles of carbon dioxide that are coming out of the seabed. And they are naturally acidifying the water, right? So we are acidifying the water by dumping carbon dioxide into the air, which then is getting absorbed from above. And in this particular place, there's, the water is being acidified from below by these volcanic vents. So these, this, this British scientist named Jason Hall Spencer got this idea, okay, if I look and see what's happening in this naturally acidified part of the world, I'm going to be looking into the future. I'm going to be seeing what an acidified ocean uh, will look like. And this next picture that I'm going to show you, what you need to know about it is that the level of acidification that we're looking at is where we could re what we would reach ocean-wide, so across the whole world, uh, if we keep pouring CO2 uh, into the oceans for another century or so. So this is what it looks like when you get up close to those vents, uh, sort of like a, a lunar landscape. Many, many species cannot survive. This is a pH of 7.8 for the chemists in the room, uh, and that's the level of acidification uh, we could reach ev very easily by 2100 uh, if, we, if we don't turn uh, those trend lines down uh, pretty soon. So Charles Darwin, who visited a reef um, in the South Pacific, oh, sorry, this is another um, place that I visited. Uh, where people are looking at the effects of ocean acidification, which is the Great Barrier Reef. So you're looking at an, a little tiny island called Heron Island, which, as you see, just pokes above the reef. Uh, and that sort of pale, pale blue color, that is actually the reef that's underwater, and the green is the little tiny bit that sticks above the water. And Darwin, who visited a reef, not the Great Barrier Reef, but a reef um, uh, in the South Pacific, um, during the voyage of the Beagle, he wrote that reefs rank among high amongst the wonderful objects in the world. And any of you who have been to a reef um, know, know that he was correct. Something like a quarter of all marine species spend at least part of their lives on reefs. And the result of experiments looking at the effects of acidification on reefs, and there are also a lot of people looking at the effects of acidification and also of warming, which, as far as reefs are concerned, uh, is sort of a double whammy. Um, those experiments are, are pretty grim, I'm afraid. Um, the results pretty strongly suggest that reefs will not survive this century. Um, this is just a quote from some British uh, marine biologists who study reefs. Um, it's not at all you know, a radical uh, statement. It's a pretty mainstream statement. Uh, it's likely that reefs will be the first major ecosystem in the modern era to become ecologically extinct. <clears throat> and 
<clears throat> as I said, something like a quarter of marine species spend part of their lives on reefs, so it's pretty hard to overstate the importance of this. And times in the, in the past, just to go back to you know, those mass extinctions of the past, times in the past when reefs have gone out, you know, have, have collapsed, um, are associated with, with some of the worst crises in the history of life. So another way that we're changing the planet, and this is the last one I'm gonna talk about tonight, um, is by moving species around the world. You are all very familiar with invasive species. There are, there are lots of them here in Oregon. In fact, I saw one of the tables out there. People were, had um, cookbooks, eat your local invasive species. Um, so it's uh, obviously an issue that's on people's minds here. Um, but I was recently actually in, in New Zealand where it's a huge, huge issue. Um, it's a very extreme case in New Zealand because before humans arrived on New Zealand, uh, it had no land mammals. It had, it had a couple of species of bats, um, but it didn't have any, any rodents, so it didn't have any mice or rats. Uh, it didn't have any ungulates, so it you know, didn't have any deer or anything like that. It didn't have any marsupials like they have in Australia, so it didn't have any you know, kangaroos or wallabies. Uh, all it had was this very, very interesting bird fauna, which had sort of grown, ev evolved to take up some of the ecological space that in other places, like here in the U.S., is taken up by mammals. And when humans came, they, they changed all this. Um, these are Pacific rats. Um, they're kind of cute as rats go. Um, and they were brought to New Zealand by the Maori already back uh, around the year 1300. Um, and they were probably brought purposefully as a, as a source of food, um, but the, um, the Maori intended to eat them, um, but the rats had other plans. And so they multiplied and they spread a lot faster than they could be consumed. Um, and along the way, they encountered all of these birds that had evolved in the absence of mammalian predators, so flightless, a lot of flightless birds, flightless rails, flightless ducks, uh, flightless geese. Um, and they had no defenses against a predator like a rat, and they were very quickly wiped out, so there was a, a big wave of extinctions not long after the Maori arrived. Uh, and then in the 19th century, the Europeans came along, and they brought with them more rats. They brought two uh, much fiercer species of rats, the Norway rat and the ship rat, and those two species of rats have practically driven the Pacific rat into extinction in New Zealand. It's very hard to find a Pacific rat anymore. Um, they were accidental introductions um, by Europeans. Um, but then there were also a lot of purposeful introductions by the Europeans. For example, uh, the British brought uh, European rabbits because they wanted to go rabbit hunting. Uh, and these rabbits also had no native predators. And uh, so they reproduced, um, you know, like, like rabbits. Um, and they completely overran the countryside. They uh, literally drove farmers uh, bankrupt. And the farmers got pretty upset about this. Um, so they came up with the idea of introducing, uh, also from Europe, uh, stoats, which are short-tailed short weasels. We, we do not have this particular weasel species here in North America, but we, we have long-tailed weasels. So, so these are European uh, weasels, basically. Uh, and they're very, very good hunters. And the idea was they were supposed to hunt the rabbits. Um, but as you probably have already guessed from the way this story is going, they did not go after the rabbits. Uh, they went after the rest of the birds. Um, so this set off another wave of extinctions that is still very much ongoing today. And I'm going to just show you um, a couple of species that survived long enough so that we have specimens of them. Um, these, are, these birds are called hui, they're very beautiful as you can see, or they were very beautiful. And what's really interesting about them is they have those different shaped beaks, very differently shaped beaks. And the theory is, you know, these are a male and a female, that they were paired, uh, and that they use their beaks to hunt different kinds of insects, get at different kinds of insects. Um, this is a, a Stevens Island wren. It's also another really interesting bird. It was one of the very, very few flightless songbirds uh, probably ever to have existed. And both of those species were wiped out around the turn of the century, so around the very beginning of the 20th century. So moving species around the world is something that we do all the time now. 
Um, many of you probably have non-native species in your backyards. You have non-native species as pets. Um, it strikes us as very, very ordinary. But when you think about it, it's something that's very, very new. Because without a lot of help, um, you know, a land species cannot cross an ocean and an aquatic species cannot cross a continent. So we are bringing together these lineages that evolved separately for tens of millions of years. And when you do that, you know, you can get some pretty nasty surprises. And this bringing together of species is another way that you could say we are running geological history backwards and at a very high speed. Um, around 250 million years ago, all of the world's land masses were squished together into a supercontinent called, that we now call Pangaea. And, and then owing to you know, the vagaries of plate tectonics, they broke apart and we got the world more or less as we know it today. And by bringing together all of these lineages that evolved separately on these separate continents, we are in effect, you know, biotically speaking, squishing the continents back together again. And so you'll sometimes hear biologists say we are creating the new Pangaea. So I'm just gonna show you a couple more wonderful creatures. Um, this is the species that I um, began my book with. Um, it's called the Panamanian golden frog. It's very beautiful, as you can see. It used to be considered a lucky symbol in Panama. Its, um, its image was printed on lottery tickets. Um, it's native to the central part of Panama. You know, so Panama is sort of long and skinny, and it runs from uh, you know, west to east, and or east to west, however you want to look at it, and it's native to the middle part of the country. Um, and about 15 years ago, people realized that something was moving through Central America, uh, killing amphibians. And biologists really had to scramble uh, to figure out what was going on. And they finally figured out that what was moving through Central America was a fungal disease. And they could actually see it moving. So by the time it got to Central Panama, they were sort of watching it move through the country. Uh, and they rushed to get some of these beautiful frogs uh, out of the rainforest and into some kind of uh, you know, facility so that some would be left. Um, but uh, unfortunately what happened was the facility was not built uh, by the time they needed it, by the time this fungal disease arrived. So the frogs um, literally ended up spending several months in a hotel. So people actually you know, watched these frogs go extinct in, in real time. They are now extinct in the wild. Um, although you can see them, this is the facility that was built, uh, so they got out of their hotel rooms and into this facility. Um, there are still some Panamanian golden frogs there, and there are still some in zoos, um, but they are extinct in the wild now. And scientists are still not 100% sure how this fungus got moved around the world. Um, it's been killing amphibians all around the world, uh, in Australia, in South America, here in North America, in the, in the Sierras, for example. Uh, and in Europe. Um, but it seems pretty clear that it must have been moved around the world somehow by people since it spread around the globe very fast, a lot faster than you know, a fungus could get around on its own. And one theory, it's just a theory that I will share with you, it's been very hard to, to nail down, is that it was moved around the world on this species, which is the African clawed species, which is interesting because it was used as an early pregnancy test. And if you, if you take the urine of a woman who is pregnant and you inject an African clawed frog uh, with it, it will lay eggs very quickly. So it was used as an early pregnancy test in the 30s and 40s and exported all around the world for that purpose. So one theory is that that fungus might have been moved around on African clawed frogs. Um, but just to give you a sense of the scale uh, of what we're doing, of, of moving creatures around the world, um, it's estimated that in the ballast water of our super tankers, every single day, uh, 10,000 species are being moved around the world. So those are three of the ways that we are changing the world. Um, and they all have the un very unfortunate side effect of driving our fellow creatures um, extinct. And when I wrote the book, I very consciously um, stopped short of offering any kind of prescription um, any sort of 10-step you know, plan for averting the sixth extinction. And um, I'm afraid that's also how I'm gonna end this evening. Um, I'm not going to you know, offer us a way out of all this, a uh, sort of prescription uh, uh, for how we're gonna get out of this because um, to be very frank, I, I don't have that prescription. 
And I'm also not going to end with a clear, you know, sort of neat moral resolution um, because I don't have one of those um, either. Instead, I'm going to I'm going to end sort of um, circle back and end sort of where I began um, with another um, very very charismatic but uh, sexually confused bird. Um, this particular bird is named Sirocco, um, and I met him. Uh, about four or five months ago when I was in New Zealand. And he's a, he's a kakapo. Um, and kakapo are another example of these really interesting birds that exist only in New Zealand. Um, they're flightless parrots. They're the world's only flightless parrots. They're also the world's heaviest parrots. They're, they're quite big. Um, they're about the size of an osprey. Um, and they're very beautiful. Um, and as you can see, at the same time, they're also somewhat uh, comical looking. And they used to be everywhere in New Zealand. Um, and now there are exactly uh, 126 of them left. And except for Sirocco, they all live on two uh, little islands which have been cleared of rats and stoats and all other predatory mammals. So when Sirocco um, was a chick, he got sick. He got a rep respiratory infection. And he ended up getting raised by people, so um, a lot like Kanoe. Uh, and he was also imprinted by this experience. Um, and so when he reached sexual maturity, uh, he kept trying to mate with people. Um, and, you know, as I, as I said, um, kakapo are pretty big. Um, and I should also mention they're nocturnal. So he was on these um, little, this on, on one of these little islands, and there were people there, you know, rangers, conservation rangers, and volunteers who were trying to bring the species, you know, back from the absolute brink of extinction. Um, and during mating season, in the middle of the night, uh, people would be going to the outhouse, and uh, Sirak would fly at their heads and try to mate with him. Um, and so it was, you know, decided for everyone's sake that he was going to have to be moved. Um, and so he now lives alone, um, sort of on his own private island. Um, but sometimes he goes out on tour. He's sort of a, a bit of a rock star, actually. Um, and he goes out on tour so that New Zealanders can see a kakapo because, except for him, they will never see one. Um, and that is where I saw him. He was on tour. He was, he's behind glass here. Uh, he, was, uh, he was on a show, in a show uh, at a museum. Um, and Sirocco, I think, is another emblem, you know, of this very strange new world uh, that we are creating. And I don't think this is because um, humans are, are, are vicious or uncaring, though, though we certainly have the capacity uh, to be that. Uh, but I think it is because in certain sense, maybe um, like, not unlike uh, Kanoe and Sirocco, we are somewhat confused creatures ourselves. And I'm going to uh, end there tonight. Thanks very much.